thought Representative Wolf Moore was dancing or something over there. All right, where's my other glasses? All right, are we turned on yet? I can't hear anybody. Nope. I think we are. Can you hear there me? We are. Yeah, there we are. Okay, I can hear now. Myself. You must have everybody automatically muted when you get on. Okay. Troy, do you want to read the disclaimer or? No, I can read that. You will? Yeah. Good. Thank you. Unless you were just wanting to do it yourself. And... I'm worried I'm going to have it memorized. So. Well, that's the thing. I should have it memorized by now. Yeah. See who we got all on here. We got Will. Kyle's going to be joining by phone. Okay. Got Kathy, Will. Jill's there. She's waving. I see Jill and I, I see all the staff. They all look great in those jackets and ties when it's hot out. I'm so professional. Yeah. How come you guys aren't moving? You look so good in those professional pictures. <laughs> Let's see. All I right. See. The, uh, Director Harrison Lee is on. She is? Okay, good. Yeah, she is. Hello, how are you? Hi, good. great. Good. Thanks for joining us. Yes, yeah, thank you. I know it was extremely short notice, but thank you for yes. accommodating your schedule and being able to join us today. Yes, I found out about this Friday night. <laughs> oh, I found out about it Friday morning. So oh, okay. <laughs> I get everything organized, so I appreciate you being on. All right. So um, since we're trying to figure out who's on first until LCC starts, do you want to chair this? Troy, it doesn't matter to me either way. Yeah, I can go ahead and, okay. uh, and chair the meeting. Okay. Um, since that's our regularly, I mean, one of the days that LCC had appropriated to us for Wednesday, I'll chair that meeting as well. Uh, okay. And then when we get the new dates, then you'll be chair. Yeah. Okay, I see Tom. I don't see Rick. I don't see Billinger yet, sir. Billinger. There's Tom. I'll just give a. Let me. Um, I'll just to text him. Make sure he is all right. He's on a different time zone, of course. So, are you getting on to Zoom? Let me find out if Kyle's on. New face, Will. Hi, Will. <laughs> Hi, Tom. Hi, Carolyn. Hi, Troy. Hi, Hi Tom. Tom. Okay, Kyle will be joining us pretty soon. So why don't we go ahead and get started and I'll read the statement that uh, we have to read for these Zoom calls um, and go ahead and get the meeting started. Um, once again, I want to thank all of you for joining um, this meeting on a very uh, short notice, um, but we wanted to discuss um, some of the items that the, uh, where the state of Kansas budget is sitting right now. And so JG is gonna be going through a profile for us uh, in regards to the state budget. And then uh, and then we do have Cheryl Harrison Lee here um, who will kind of go through the details um, of what the executive committee and the task force has also uh, discussed, which uh, Tom, myself, Kathy, and Carolyn are members of the task force committee. And then on um, kind of as an update of what was discussed at this morning's um, executive meeting um, as well. And this is kind of in anticipation of the State Finance Council meeting that we'll be having tomorrow in the Capitol at 3.30.
Um, so the Legislative Budget Committee is meeting remotely today by Zoom meeting. Members, staff, and conferees making presentations before the committee are participating in the Zoom meeting. Due to health and safety concerns, members of the public are not in attendance at this meeting, but full access to this meeting allows members of the public without cost to listen to the meeting through the use of live stream audio broadcasting on the internet. The audio link can be reached by www.kslegislature.org, selecting the audio video link and State House Live and Archive, or using the link provided in the meeting notification from Legislative Administrative Services. The video of this meeting may be accessed on the Kansas Legislature's channel on YouTube. The agenda for this meeting has been posted on the Kansas Legislature website. Any other documents presented during this meeting will be available on the Kansas Legislature website. All participants will state their name and title each time the individual begins speaking or voting so that the individual can be readily identified by remote listeners. All participants are required to ensure that microphones, phones, or other electronic devices are muted when the participants are not seeking, speaking so that the ability of remote listeners or observers to hear the proceedings is not unnecessarily impeded. The person who has the floor to speak is requested to not have background noise. Many members, if you cannot clearly hear the speaker, please notify the host through the chat function. This chat feature will communicate only with the meeting host who will communicate with the chairman. The chat feature will not communicate with the rest of the committee. Committee members seeking recognition to comment or ask questions of the conferees should send a quest through that chunk functionality. Members should not begin speaking until recognized by the chairperson. Members should state their names clearly before, before proceeding with a question or comment. Each motion, if any, will be clearly stated before the committee votes. Any vote will be by roll call vote and the chairperson will announce the results of the final vote. Public comment will not be allowed at this meeting. And during this legislative budget committee meeting, the committee will not recess to a closed or executive meeting pursuant to KSA 75-4319 and amendments thereto. Audio will be available on the legislature's official website within 30 minutes of the adjournment of this meeting for members of the public to review. And the host reserves the right to mute participants with excessive or repeat background noise to improve communication quality for this meeting. As Carol and I were mentioning, we should have those, that statement memorized by as many Zoom meetings that we've had uh, during the interim and, and while the session is adjourned. Um, so now I will turn it over to Sky. Uh, are you on? Yes. And we'll go ahead and do a roll call. Okay. Um, Senator Bellinger. Senator Hawk. Present. Sen uh, Representative Carpenter. He's present. Okay. Um, Representative Hoffman. Senator McGinn. I'm here and I want to let you know that uh, Senator Billinger, in case he might have been a delay to I because he's trying, he's on the phone and he's trying to get on video. So I just want to let you know he's present. Okay. Thank you. And Representative. This is Representative Hoffman. I'm on too. Sorry. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. That's it, Chair. Okay. Yeah. Here you call my name, so I didn't know if I was supposed to. Oh, I think it's obvious that I'm on, so I don't think you need to uh, ask whether or not I'm on the call or not. So. Well, we'll go ahead and move into the uh, first major item on the agenda, and that is an overview of the state general fund. Um, and so, uh, JG Scott, if you will give us an update on where things are standing for the budget for the state of Kansas. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just wanted to um, set kind of the, the tone for where we are financially as far as the state general fund goes. Um, if you remember in April, we reduced state general fund receipts over the two years by about $1.3 billion. So our estimates were to uh, have money coming in, uh, COVID hit, and at that point in time, um, while we did those estimates in April, there was not a whole lot of information as far as receipts go. Um, so there was really some uh, very calculated estimates on how much each of these um, categories would be bringing in. So we did reduce 
income tax by about 12%, uh, corporate uh, reduction of about 17, almost 18%, uh, retail sales about one and a half percent. So there were a fair amount of reductions, though uh, in, in, in all, um, the largest portion of the reduction uh, for 2020 was in the delayed receipt of uh, taxes from April 15th to July 15th. And from all of the funding sources, that reduction was $645.8 million. So we had 640, you know, I'll just say $650 million. We were anticipating to come in in 2020 that got shifted to 2021. So overall, it's not a big change, but in the fiscal years, it was a, a very large change. But uh, there, were, there were numerous reductions on top of that, that like I said, brought that total reduction to um, 1.3 billion over the two years. So um, I did send out a profile that was, that we did April 20th. Um, we were debating this morning on whether this should be updated or not because included in the profile our human services caseloads that were estimated in April uh, of 2020. It was savings about 106 million this year and costs of about $170 million next fiscal year. Um, we decided not to because those are the best estimates we have as far as the impact to the state general fund uh, of, uh, of caseloads. Um, so, do you remember that when we talk about right now, the profile shows a $205 million ending balance that's positive in the current year and a negative $650 million that's positive in the out year. Our expenditures will go down by the $100 million. That money will not show up as um, as, I'm sorry, it will show up as, as reduction in expenditures um, and it will show an, an increase then in 2021 of about $170 million. So when we looked at the uh, beginning balance for 2020, about a billion one, revenue was estimated 6825000000 about $7.9 billion available. We have our approved expenditures. It does include the human services caseloads. Um, then expenditures would show about $7.7 billion, ending balance of about $200 million. $200 million, revenue coming in at $7.2, 7230 700 billion, $230 million. Total revenue available, about 7.4. Total expenditures for 2021 as approved was about almost $8.1 billion. So that would show a shortfall in 2021 of $653 million. If we were looking to what the um, amount that would have to be adjusted as far as getting back to a zero ending balance in 2021, it would have to be closer to $760 million. Um, and that is because the bill, there was no bill that took the receipts um, that came in as far as um, the medic, mainly the Medicaid expansion, or not expansion, the Medicaid match rate uh, reduction because of COVID. It saved um, in the neighborhood of $100 million. Since that didn't show up as a reduction in the budget, 
it will be available in 2021. So if the governor does allotments, that would be one of the allotments that would be made that would show that the reductions were much higher than, than the 650 million would have as a shortfall. But right now, that's what our projection would be between the two years, if all of the savings were to occur, it would be about $750 million to the negative. Um, though we have had some good news, um, like I said, those were all estimates that we had made without any sales tax receipts coming in, uh, without uh, knowing any of the reductions that we were gonna be having in income tax. When we looked at the receipts from May, total receipts for May came in about $17.3 million above what we had expected. So in, in all the estimates were really pretty close. May receipts, individual income tax was about 7.1 million higher than we anticipated. Corporate was about 9 million less than we anticipated. What came in better than anticipated um, by a fair amount was retail sales by 16.6 million and compensating use by about 8.7 million. So taxes came in about $28 million higher than, than estimated. There was that $10 million transfer from the state general fund to the disaster relief fund, the emergency fund. So that took that 28 down to that uh, close to $17 million by time it was all said and done. So um, coming in slightly better than anticipated, though the estimates really are showing pretty close to what, what those uh, uh, impact of the the COVID uh, shutdown really did show. So all things considered, estimates were really pretty close, maybe a little better than we anticipated. Still looking at a state general fund shortfall once everything is calculated in of about $650 million for next fiscal year. So overall, that's a quick brief overview of where we are with the state general fund right now and um, be glad to answer any questions if you have any. Well, I guess um, you kind of answered it looking through the state general fund receipts uh, through the end of May. And it's, it's promising that actually the receipts were better than what was anticipated uh, when uh, they did the, uh, uh, the consensus revenue estimates in April. Um, and even though it's 17 million, is that right? 17.3 million? Yeah. Um, Still, I mean, the, the state budget is in a, in a deficit situation um, and it made a little bit of a, a dent into that. And so hopefully as the uh, months carry on throughout 2020, um, that'll help a little bit, um, especially if we start reopening the economy, uh, which has been uh, happening the last few weeks. Um, committee, do you have any questions for JG? I do. I have a question. Uh, Represent or uh, Senator McGinn. Thank you. Um, on the uh, estimates of the uh, property taxes coming in, um, I I heard from one of my counties that uh, even with the delay that we put in, that they had already received seventy percent of the. Uh, their taxes in do. Do we have an estimate or can you tell us from the numbers that you have, uh, how many of overall counties that has already paid in that won't go into the next fiscal year? Um, that The property tax that we receive is mainly goes into, um, into education. And I don't have a, a good number on how much that money has come in. Um, that'll be the mainly the 20 mil that goes back to uh, back to those local school districts. I had had talked with um, uh, Director Dale Dennis or Commissioner Dale Dennis about that same type of information, and he was guessing between 75 and and 80 percent of those would be coming in mainly because most of the farm. Um, uh, farm, most farmers pay their their property taxes, you know, just as is normal um, course of business, and 
a lot of the um, housing is on a, is through the mortgage companies. So those are normally coming in. So that's, that's about what he was anticipating. And, and would you share again on this F map, the, the formula that changed uh, why we're not able to capture the, that, that increment or that income from F map changes until you said until after, until after July one. Um, technically, we, we've saved all of the money. We haven't spent any of that money. But we would normally have a budget that was passed during this fiscal year that would say, okay, now we're going to save all of this money. So it shows up as savings in the current year. Since we didn't have a budget at, at the end of this, you know, for an omnibus bill, then that $100 million is going to show us carry forward into next fiscal year. Money that okay. wasn't spent it will be available. So all the money will still be available to be spent. You know, it's just kind of a, a, a technical delay. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Senator Billinger. Yes. Thank you. JG, uh, similar question on the individual and corporate taxes. Uh, a lot of folks have postponed even filing till 2021 budget year. So what kind of, what kind of uh, dollars are you looking at there? What, what, how, did, how did you guess that? <laughs> well, I mean, we, we did go through a fair amount of, of calculations and uh, worked with the Department of Revenue on how many had come in as of, as of you know, April 20th that we had recorded and um, tried to estimate then how much we would have coming in after that point in time. You know, they hadn't all been um, received back in, but we had a, a, a fairly decent idea of how much um, number wise we're going to be there. Um, and then we, in, we made some calculations on historical numbers and what they had been trending in this year, as far as the amounts of balance dues and then projected. And I believe that the uh, carry forward from 2020 into 21, I believe we had that about $620 million in individual income tax. I'll double check that number. But that's kind of how we'd looked at it is we had received a fair amount when, uh, when we had done those, those estimates and then um, had anticipated based on historical trends what those numbers were. Okay, thank. Because it seems to me like you know, if we if we trended ab above in May, that few few more folks probably filed than you you had anticipated. Yeah, and we're about seven million dollars up in income tax. Though part of the good news is that was mostly in uh, in withholding. So withholding was coming in a little bit stronger than we anticipated. The rest of it was actually really pretty close. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other further questions for JG? Excuse me, I, I do want to clarify. It was $560 million in delayed for income tax, 75 million in corporate, 8 million in financial, and then a couple of other small ones. Okay, thank you for the clarification, JG. Uh, any other questions um, in regards to the state general fund receipts? And where we're at as far as the budget. All right. Not seeing any more. Thank you, JG, for that update. Uh, we'll go ahead and now uh, move on to a uh, review and discussion of the Spark Executive Committee recommendations. Uh, once again, I want to thank Executive Director Cheryl Harrison Lee for making the, the uh, call today. Uh, I know it was short notice, and I know you have. Uh, other uh, appointments, and I'm glad you made yourself available so we can ask some questions. Um, so right now, I will uh, turn it over to you, uh, Director Harrison Lee, in regards to uh, the recommendations that have already been made by the Executive Committee, and if you could also give some type of a uh, analysis of the task force meeting that we had last Monday, and then um, some developments of the Executive Committee meeting that took place earlier this morning. So I'll turn it over to you.
Good afternoon, Cheryl Harrison, the executive director um, for the Office of Recovery. Um, I want to update you first on the progress um, and explain the first round distribution of funds um, that we proposed for the State Finance Council review. Um, we've assembled a talented team um, to help us kind of craft through the recommendations of the executive committee, as well as the steering committee members. Um, the overall, there are multiple factors at play in this effort. Um, there's the health and economic crisis to address, and we've been given the opportunity to create lasting positive changes across our state. We also have an opportunity to make investments to confront our most pressing health and economic challenges. And we want to make thoughtful investments that will generate long-term health and economic opportunities. So just by way of review again, um, here's how much money uh, in total Kansas received. And my understanding is you all received the presentation, correct, uh, Mr. Chairman? Um, I have not. You, well, have, I'm on the, uh, hand, you have a handout. That, you have the handout PowerPoint? Yes, I do have the handout from okay. the meeting we had last week. Yes. Okay. So on, on slide six, it shows that Johnson County received money directly from the feds. Cedric County received money directly from the feds. And so the state's allocation is a little over a billion dollars. Um, Johnson County and Cedric County, because they have over 500,000 people, they receive their portions directly. And we are just going to be responsible for the state's remaining portion. The purpose of the funding would be to address our public health needs as well as provide economic support. The main takeaway is that by December 30th, and we haven't received any additional guidance, all of the funds must be distributed. So we wanted to move funds quickly, understanding that we've had over 240 deaths, over 950 hospitalizations and 200 thousand plus citizens who have filed for unemployment. So we propose a three phased approach. Um, the first round of funding would be focused on strengthening our health to allow the economy to reopen safely and to remain open. The goal of the approach for this funding is to create a process that has three components, fair, impactful, and timely. The second round will be to focus on revitalizing the economy, which will require strategic investments that not only address the pressing short-term needs, but also create long-term opportunities for growth. And that is where we see the SPARC task force providing the most, the greatest assistance because we can use their expertise to be able to help us come up with strategic investments. The third round focuses on reemergence. Many experts are predicting another spike in COVID-19 cases this fall, and we wanna make sure that we are prepared for it. So we see this phase as a hybrid of health and economic related investments. Hopefully it doesn't occur and we're able to focus these investments on our economic recovery, but we wanna have a safety net just in case we see a reemergence. So we believe this phased approach will ensure us to make sound, timely investments along the way. So the timeline for the first phase is in June, we are looking to be able to distribute 400 million to the local governments. The second round, hopefully in August, we're looking at up to 525 million. And then with the third round, looking at uh, October up to the remaining 324 million. The first round to local governments represents about 39% of the funding. And the second round, depending on how much we distribute, would go up to half with the remaining uh, 11 to 31%, depending on how much we allocate in the second round. The way we approach how much we were looking to distribute Remember we talked about goals being fair, impactful, and timely. So here's what we thought would be fair. Because Johnson and Sedgwick County received their money directly and they have over 500,000 residents, if you divide their portion of the population by the amount they received, it comes out to being 
per person in the county. So we thought that since all Kansas, payers, Kansas taxpayers would be equally um, impacted, that we would look at the same methodology that the federal government looked at and distribute $194 per person as well. So if we were to give all of the remaining counties $194 per person, it would equal about $350 million. So the other aspect is, while that might be fair, is it impactful? We know that the needs that are related to COVID-19 have not been equally distributed among our population. So if you were to consider that the COVID-19 rates per 1,000 uh, person in each county, if we were to look at Raleigh County, it's got a population of 72,000 people, but it has less than one case per 1,000. If we were to look at Ford County, it has 52 cases per 1,000, but it only has 33,000 people in the county. So if we were to just use population to distribute the funds, Raleigh County would receive double the funds as Ford and has been less impacted. So we, we thought we needed a plan that was impactful as well. And we wanna address those areas that are hurting the most. Conversely, if you look at Raleigh County's unemployment rate, it's only 9%, nearly double that of 5% that would be, should be considered as well in Ford County. So that basically confirms the health and economic crisis. And if we're going to be impactful, then we wanna consider those health and economic factors. So we came up with an additional $50 million, which is how we got to the 400 million which allows us to look at a COVID impact factor. Now, Johnson and Sedgwick counties, although they've received their funding directly from the federal government, and that resulted in approximately $194 per person, we thought they wouldn't be eligible for the first approximately $350 million, but the additional $50 million, which is an impact factor, that they should be eligible for that as well. Sedgwick County actually has the highest unemployment rate in the state, so it is greatly impacted. So in looking at the expenditures for the first round, we looked at two ways to do that. Reimbursements for COVID-19 expenses and direct aid. When we started looking at what some of the other states were doing, one of the things that we learned from Oregon was there was pushback from local governments because they were so cash-strapped that they were not able to make purchases. So if you only allowed reimbursements, it was problematic. They considered alternatively providing a portion of the funds that would be direct aid rather than requiring reimbursement. They would still have the same restrictions on how the funds are spent. They would still need to be able to certify that they spent it consistent with the CARES guidance, but it would give the local governments more flexibility. So in the first round of distribution, we looked at a 50-50 split that half of the funding would be their portion for reimbursements and the other half would be the direct aid. If the counties don't need all of their allotments or use all of their allotments by the deadline, we're asking that those funds be recouped and directed to areas where they're needed most by the third round. And that would allow us to basically redistribute. We would have sufficient time to redistribute if we get that by October, by the time we're looking to distribute the final round of funds. So the funds are being distributed to the counties under this scenario, however, which is exactly what the federal government has been doing across the US. However, the committee expressed concern about making sure that local governments that the counties are also looking at distributing to the localities, to cities and school um, uh, boards as well in their respective counties. So we are encouraging, and as part of the resolution that the counties will receive, it will include asking them to share those funds with taxing entities in their counties. So in terms of a schedule and a recap, the 
anticipation is that we would get approval this week, that we could notify the counties this week also. We have prepared draft resolutions to assist them to have approval by their respective counties. They would have until uh, next month to be able to get those resolutions back to us and then we would be able to distribute those funds. They would also, the committee asked that they have some accountability so that they would be reporting. So monthly they would be required to provide reporting to the recovery office on how those funds are being spent. If they're not able to spend them, we're asking them by uh, the fall to also let us know that they will not be spending those funds and so that we can look at what can be redistributed. For the next round of, of funding, we are uh, looking at trying to have a process that will allow public and private entities that will be available eligible to receive funding. In the first round, only local governments. The second and third round, we're looking at an opportunity for public and private. The guidance is still evolving. We received one set of guidance on April 22nd. We received a second set of guidance on May 28th. So it is a little bit of a moving uh, target. At the Joint Steering Committee and Executive Committee meeting that was held last week, the committee looked at allocating funds through four key areas, economic development, education, infrastructure, and health. The goal would be once we have uh, completed the distribution or at least have the distribution of the first round of funding available, that we would be looking at a process that would allow for public and private uh, partnerships for funding in those categories. And so we will be continuing to meet with the steering committee and the executive committee to detail out that process. You ask about the meeting today. The meeting today, the executive committee recommended approval of a budget for the Office of Recovery, as well as for reimbursement of some of the agency funds that have been spent uh, to date. And I'll answer questions at this time. Right, and thank you, Director Harrison Lee, um, <clears throat> for that uh, analysis of what's been going on with the Spark Executive Committee and also the Steering Committee on, on what the time frame exactly is on the dollars that have been received by the federal government. Um, I have been actually receiving a lot of questions uh, since our meeting last Monday, um, mainly from cities. Um, since the federal law has the money going towards the counties. Some cities are worried that they would not receive any funding from the counties when the money is dispersed. Is there anything that we can put into place or a formula where the counties would receive part of it and the city would be funneled down to the cities or would that be a direct violation of the federal law that was passed in the CARES Act? Because um, I've heard from some uh, either city administrators or city council members um, who have been told by the counties, well, the money comes to the county and so we're going to keep it. Um, so what are, what are some time of the, uh, the stringent guidelines of having, because you said the intent was the money goes to the counties according to federal law, but we want to have that go to all taxing entities within the county. Is there anything that we can concretely put into place where the, the cities would be guaranteed um, some type of funding? So let, let, me, let me clarify something. The, the funding, the way the feds distributed the funds for entities that were over 500 is it went directly to the county. The guidance allows us to distribute it to the counties or the cities. We use the same method they use, which was going to the counties. However, the executive committee has taken an additional step they had an additional motion as part of their action at the meeting that asked those counties to share the funds with the cities and other taxing entities. That will be part of the resolution that goes okay. to the county that they will need to share those funds. But no specific formula on what be no. retained by the county and then filter down like per resident of each city within the county or anything like that. It's up to the discretion of the county commissioners on how much funding each city within the county would receive. Chair Harrison Lee, Executive Director, that is correct. Okay. We did. We are not including a formula of how they need to distribute the funds. Okay. Um, 
that was probably the, the biggest question that I had after after we had met last Monday is and one of those um, I've actually heard from concerns from Johnson County um, who directly received funding from the federal government uh, where the the county and this is all hearsay so I can't say this is you know something that I heard for it was actually um, uh, just basically passed down to me is that the county has said they're going to retain all the funds and not have it go to the cities but like I said that's from a third person hearing it so I, I don't know if, if that's actually the case but there's nothing that the SPARC committee can do basically with Johnson and Sedgwick because those funds were allocated directly from the federal government. Um, so there's two answers. For the portion that was allocated from the federal government, we do not have any, any say so on those. However, there is an additional funding amount that's our impact dollars the money that we would provide through the state, that would come with the same resolution terms of distributing and sharing that with cities and other entities. Yeah. And, and is this, I mean, uh, I have yet to receive an agenda for tomorrow's uh, state finance council meeting. Um, is this gonna be kind of the same information relayed at that meeting or is it going to be a uh, different? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, Cheryl Harrison, lead executive director, I will be providing this overview as well. Okay. And with, as, as well as we will be asking for their approval of the budget items that were discussed today. With the other agencies and departments across the state? Cheryl Harrison, the executive director, yes. Um, I, well, what's the dollar amount that the, the agencies were uh, requesting? Because we kind of have a another method that we're going to be working on on Wednesday which is the $50 million that was appropriated to the Legislative Budget Committee. And then we're going to uh, forward that on to the Legislative Coordinating Council where agencies have been submitting um, basically COVID-19 related items uh, for the particular agencies. And we'll be reviewing those on Wednesday. How are, how are the two different? Oh, the Cheryl Harrison, the executive director, the amount that we asked for for approval today is a little over $16 million. Okay, but is it going to be the same requests by the other agencies or departments or are these completely separate than what we had in Senate Bill 66, the budget bill? The, I'll probably need to follow, I need to follow up and see like what you have requested in that budget bill versus what we have here. Okay. Because the, the budget bill was the state fund. Yeah, it was state fund, the state general fund. Yes, okay. not the money it's that not, came from the CARES Act. No. No, it is not the money that came from the CARES Act. Correct. Right. Uh, committee, any uh, questions? I, for I have a question, Mr. Chair, when appropriate. All right. Uh, Senator Hawk. Uh, thank you, uh, Cheryl. Thank you for being here. Uh, I don't know if you can answer this one in phase two you anticipated we might have as much as $525 million. Uh, I'm wondering if there might be some projects and, I, and I'm thinking specifically about broadband, not really knowing what we might decide on or how much money might go to that. But let's assume as an example, we had a broadband project and it involved um, uh, laying some fiber which might not get done by December 30th. Will those funds uh, be okay if they're just contracted or will the project have to be completed? Uh, or could it just be that a contract was let and uh, we might not actually pay that out until 2021 uh, later? Uh, or do we know uh, specifically from the guidelines how that might apply yet? Cheryl Harrison Lee, Executive Director. We have asked that question. Um, is it cash out the door or encumbered? And we have not received an answer. As the guidelines are currently written, it is spent. It's out the door. It, is not, it does not read where it allows for encumbrance by December 30th. Senator Hall. Follow up. Uh, do our uh, congressional representatives and senators in DC have any influence on how those guidelines might ultimately be written or interpreted? Cheryl Harrison, Lee, executive director. That's a question I would need to ask 
and get some information back to you on. And, and I only say that because it seems like there may be that there are probably a lot of things we need to do and they, I, I can see them wanting us to require the decision to be made, but I could see some real difficulty in getting some significant things that would really help both the economy and long-term health, particularly in the areas of telehealth, et cetera. So I, I hope we could do the appropriate political things if necessary and get some flexibility, at least on those things. So thank you. Okay. Uh, Representative Wolfmore. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, I was having some trouble earlier. So I have two quick questions. Um, the first one is, I think I understood. So if, for example, a local government would use some of their money that's distributed to them to help people affected by COVID and lost their jobs pay utility bills, for example, I assume that would be covered. That pot of money would have to be used up locally by December 30th. Is that what you're saying? Cheryl Harrison Lee, director, yes. Funding has to be used by December 30th as the current guidance. Indicates. Okay. Okay. And, and that would be an appropriate use of it though. This, the, um, um, example I gave of utility assistance for people who had lost their jobs or something like that, would that be? Well, it, it, they need to basically be able to tie. There have been housing uh, tenant, you know, that other states are using as long as it, they can show direct COVID impact. Right. Okay. And then my second question is, so we've got this $50 million that was budgeted and so uh, the way I understand it, because it was already in our budget at the state to cover COVID expenses, that's not something that the federal money can um, backfill or it's not a, a COVID expense because it was already in our budget or because it's COVID related, would that be covered? I'm trying to figure out if we're spending this 50 million, all these various things, is that money that we should be more directing towards this federal money or is that money that, that could be um, reimbursed because it is COVID related. Director Harrison Lee, we're not able to pay for things that are currently in the budget or use them to backfill items in the budget. Even if they were budgeted for COVID related, correct? Right. If they're previously approved in the budget, we're not able to use funds for that. Got it. But the, some of these things, if we didn't use that 50 million may qualify for the federal money if they were COVID related, correct? So there are some COVID, right, some COVID expenses that maybe you don't use those expenses for, and they would be eligible for reimbursement. Uh, like if we have items that agencies have coded for COVID related that you may have been looking to expend over there, maybe those items would be better suited on the COVID side. That's what I thought. Um, I think that's all the questions I have for now, um, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Director. So I have another question, Troy. So, uh, uh, so clear, clear. Yes. Uh, just want to ask the, the chairman. There are some of us that have our hands up. I know I have you on the list. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Oh, thank okay. you. And actually, you are next. So, Senator again. Okay. Oh, well, thank Bill, you. Uh, Representative Carpenter, I have you on the list. Billinger, okay. Hawk, Hoffman. Okay. You're all on the list. All right. Thank you. Um, I just want to, this is Senator McGinn, uh, District 31. And uh, Cheryl, I just wanted to ask, is anyone working on more specific guidelines for the local units of government? Um, I was just on a, a local unit of government call today, a uh, quasi group of uh, cities and county folks. And, and they're very concerned about how they're going to spend that money. And they don't want to get dinged that they didn't do it properly. And they feel like they don't have uh, good enough guidelines. Are we are we trying to define that? And I know that they said that Chip Westfall was working with the Kansas Association of Counties, and I even encouraged them that maybe they should come testify at our meeting on Wednesday as well. But are we are we trying to fine tune some of that for those local units of government? Um, Director Harrison Lee, yes, we actually have had an opportunity to talk with the folks over at the uh, Association of Counties to see how they might be able to assist with some technical support to the counties. Okay, thank you. And then um, again, Senator McGinn, I had the next question I have is, 
Um, and the JG may need to be uh, kind of listening in on this. I, I ended up gonna maybe combine two of these questions, but on that coronavirus 50 million that we put in before we left, is it possible that we just don't even spend that money on coronavirus at all and it stays in the budget and then when we come back, this may be a, co a question for JG, when we come back in January, why couldn't we just shift those dollars not used and use the federal dollars and shift those dollars after we come back into other areas where we need it? I think that'd be a way to get around having to spend the 50 million on coronavirus. Um, <clears throat> that, that could be something to, to look into. Um, we'd have to be careful to make sure that we're spending Corona money on Corona items and not backfilling it with, with unbudgeted. Um, there are some expenditures that may need to be made though um, from the state general fund that would not be able to be used for any other type of federal funds. So when we're looking at those expenditures, and I, I think we'll probably have some conversation on that um, Wednesday when, when the director comes in about what we can use some of those Corona federal funds for and not use any of the state general fund portion of it for. It'd so, be like any other, excuse me, thank you, Senator McGinn. It'd be like any other um, uh, item that's in our budget that doesn't use and it just laps back into the general fund, yeah. I would think. But I knew I know we do have some coronavirus letter requests out there, which is what we're going to be looking at Wednesday as well. Correct. So, and JG Scott with Let's Sleep Research, and uh, you're correct. There might be some of those that there's a couple of situations where they they need to have some state general fund because it's matching some federal funds. So it may need to use some of that um, state general fund money, but any of it that can be used for the uh, to uh, for the federal funds to be used, I think there will be a, a, a very serious conversation and there will be good questions to ask every time there's a conversation about using that money um, on, on the Wednesday meeting. Okay. But you're right, then, it would just lapse back into the state general fund like any other non-expenditure would. Okay. Um, and then back, my final question is back to uh, Ms. Harrison and that has to do with I know you've you've talked about it just a little bit here, but I want to really talk about it in, in very much detail. But the meeting that was held this morning, those decisions, those motions that they made will come before State Finance Council tomorrow. So the 400 million plus the decisions that they made today will come before State Finance Council tomorrow. Is that correct? I think she's on mute. Yeah, she's on mute. Yeah, but I could read her lips and she said yes. But <laughs> <laughs> Director, Director, Harrison yes, Lee. Mute. Director Harrison Lee, yes, the 400 million and the decisions made today. Okay, so you'll be sending out that information, the details, the details of the information that they voted on today. Not Director Harrison, not yes. The end it. Okay. Do you All know, right. Director Harrison Lee, was there any overlap from the request that we had been receiving for the $50 million that was appropriated in the budget bill to the, the items that were approved today by the executive committee? Or the, JG, do you know? JG Scott, let's say research. My understanding is that the Department of Corrections will be lowering their request because they did get some COVID money. So I think that there was some overlap in some of, not necessarily the money that is from the COVID relief fund, but from other um, COVID relief money that's available. Director Harrison Lee, so there shouldn't be any overlap in the, those requests. Go ahead, thank you. Uh, that, that's all I had, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you, Senator McGinn. Uh, Representative Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, this is Representative Hoffman. I have uh, uh, actually several questions, if that's okay. But um, I guess starting off, you've mentioned that the 
400000 is going to be asked for, but also what was decided on today. And why, why do we not have a list of what was decided on today as far as you said that there was a budget decided? Um, so how much, how much is in that budget and what's, uh, what's salaries and, and just the particulars of it? I, I was pretty sure that we were, that, that was supposed to go through us before it went through the, went to the finance council. So do you have all that information that, uh, that you can give to us right now? So, uh, Representative Hoffman, uh, I was asked to cover the high the uh, 400 million, but I do have uh, Will Lawrence on the phone, so he can perhaps uh, respond to that. Uh, Will Lawrence. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Representative uh, Hoffman. So uh, a couple of things I'd say is uh, at one point in time, I think the Joint Legislative Budget Committee was contemplated as being officially in um, this um, chain of approval, but in the House Bill 2016, uh, to my understanding, joint legislative budget is not officially um, included as part of the process. Um, however, you know, certainly um, happy to, to have um, Director Harrison Lee um, and you know, members of her team appear before um, this committee to, to do that and build it into the process. Uh, I think part of the issue is, is that with the Finance Council being set for tomorrow, um, and this meeting got called, I think maybe it was Friday or kind of going to the weekend, it came very quickly, which made it a little bit difficult to get some of the information uh, available. Um, but I think that's why uh, some of the information has not been, been provided that happened this morning. Um, it was, uh, contemplated for the executive committee to make the approvals, which would then go to finance council for approval. And so we actually had a discussion about this last Monday and when we were in our breakout sessions, I think there was a misclarification of what was in the previous COVID-19 bill to what was the bill that was passed during the special session um, where the joint legislative budget committee was kind of the, I don't want to say the stopgap entity uh, in the in the original COVID-19 legislation. And then in the special session one, it moved uh, from, to the State Finance Council. Um, but I know we had a discussion because uh, Director Harrison Lee was actually by our breakout session when we were having that discussion. And, and we had come, you know, said, no, the, the legislation that was passed has the decision and I have to, I want to ask this question is, does the executive committee contain all of the authority in approving the dollars and not the steering committee at all? Or is it just the executive committee that has the approval of, of uh, voting on the expenditure of funds? And that'd be for uh, Director Harrison Lee. Director Harrison Lee, so the executive committee is the one that is actually voting for the recommendation that goes to the finance council. Okay, so the executive committee has the authority to um, administer funds to the state finance council and the state finance council has the final vote on whether or not to um, expend those dollars according yes. to legislation. Okay. This way of a clarification on what the process is and, and everything. Um, because yeah, that discussion came up in regards to the Joint Legislative Budget Committee. Um, and then when that was not included in the legislation that was passed and signed by the governor um, during the special session, uh, we still felt it was prudent for the Legislative Budget Committee to be a still a, a part of the process and, and that's why on Friday, um, we, we scheduled this uh, at the last moment meeting. Um, so I do apologize for that. Um, but I, I, I do thank all of you for being here and, and uh, being able to discuss these items um, so we can have a, a public discussion and, and air out some questions that we might have. I think it's good to go ahead and have these questions now uh, ahead of the State Finance Council meeting so we don't have a repetitive 
uh, or a lengthy discussion in the State Finance Council, and we can maybe can alleviate um, some of the questions that may be out there in regards to some of the funds. Um, Representative Hoffman, did you have any more questions? Yeah, I did. I, I, uh, how, how much is the total then that's going to be asked tomorrow at the State Finance Council? If I remember right, Director Harrison Lee, uh, a total of four hundred and sixteen million. For four hundred million, and yes, four hundred sixteen, and then an additional nine eighty six for uh, office to be able to correct. Okay. Nine hundred eighty six for the office. Director Harrison Lee. Could, yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, if we can, I mean, I I'd like to to see that the breakdown of of those you know, how all that broke down, but uh, if you could send that out. Um, the other question I have is on the telehealth. Are the, the money that's going to the counties, will they be able to use that for the tele, for telehealth? Um, the the uh, guidance uh, has in it that we can use funds for uh, public health emergency. You can use it for telemedicine as long as it's necessary for the public health emergency. So they could. Okay. They, they could. Okay. Well, one of the questions I had, you said that, that uh, any money that they don't use is going to be returned back and put into uh, the, the, the slush fund or whatever you want to call it that, that would go back to uh, that the counties could ask for later. But if they have till December to spend it, then how are you going to reappropriate that money? Director Harrison Lee. So we are asking that they let us know early fall if they're not going to be able to use those funds and that they return those funds by the time we are distributing the final round, which will allow us to then put it back out no later than October in hopes that it can be spent by December. Okay, but if they have something that they know is gonna be in December, they can keep it even after that, even after the October. Uh, right, Director Harrison Lee, they, they need to just indicate they their plans to spend the money and then they will have until December 30th to spend the money. Okay, my, my last question is, and I know it's not part of, the, uh, of this, I guess right now, but I'm getting a lot of uh, pushback about the uh, education funds and it, and it appears that the, I guess it's the gear fund. Um, it appears that those are only going to go to the, the region and then a small portion to K-12 and that the private schools are not going to be involved in any of those funds. Is that correct? I'm not able to answer that. Uh, Will, is that something that you can answer? Or do we need to get back with them on that? Will Lawrence, Governor Chief of Staff, um, a couple of these questions are probably going to be best handled by the Division of Budget. Uh, but my understanding right now is that the the gear funds uh, are slated exactly as they were described um, by you, Representative Hoffman, um, for uh, border regents um, and a, a portion for K-12. Well, I would strongly suggest that we relook at that. There's no reason why. Um, I know that other states are using a certain percentage of that money for the private uh, colleges also. And, and it specifically says from what I understand that private colleges are eligible. And so I, I ask that we relook at that before the final guidance is put out. We'll certainly, Will Lawrence, Governor Chief of Staff, will certainly take that into consideration. Thank you for that. For the suggestion. And then, uh, one last question, uh, Mr. Chairman, can uh, can Will send out the uh, uh, make sure that we get the salary uh, breakdown on the uh, for the uh, the agency the the uh, the Office of Recovery. The Harris Lee. Is, yes, I'm sorry, Office of Recovery. Yeah. Yeah, Will, could you supply that for us for the members on the Joint Legislative Budget Committee? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'll work with uh, with uh, JG to get that information over. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. 
I do kind of have a, a question for Director Harrison Lee in regards to the money that's been going to the counties. Um, and, and Representative Hoffman had the question, you know, like, well, you know, how do we know if they're going to be spending that money? And then it goes back. Um, and Johnson and Sedgwick, uh, they have until December 30th as well. And if they don't spend the 116 million that was received by Johnson County and the 99 million received by Sedgwick County, they have to directly give that back to the federal government. Is that correct? Director Harrison Lee, that is correct. And so basically because all the other 103 counties will be receiving the funds through uh, this format, it'll be coming back to us. And if it's not spent or used in another capacity, then we'd have to give it back to the federal government by December 30th. Director Harrison Lee, that is correct. Okay. Um, Representative Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Representative Will Carpenter here. This question is for uh, Director Harrison Lee. Um, on this guidance, I, I may have missed some of these Zoom calls, but it's still, uh, and, and if you could say, I don't know, it may be a giant federal document, so, but is there a breakdown of the guidance? But the last Zoom that I was on about this, it, it was about COVID expenses. I've talked to numerous uh, counties and cities and they basically are not gonna have any. And so I, I'm just curious about how this guidance is gonna change uh, that we'll be able to spend this money differently than what we are at this point in time. And uh, your thoughts on that. Director Harrison Lee, we, we were, I was on a call um, about two weeks ago and we were thinking that we would have received some updated guidance on some of the questions that have come up, um, particularly one the one about the funding and the December 30th date so we are still anticipating that we might get an update on the guidance, but as of this date, the latest one we have is the one that was from the end of May. Okay, well, like I said, I'm just concerned that these counties aren't gonna have any expenses for COVID and the money's just gonna be sitting there. The other, I have another question about this and, and this just goes to a broad brush to, to everybody. Um, I think, one of the huge things that in our county, and I don't, I don't, I anticipate this all over the state, is child care and child care centers, and there's no doubt that that at some point in time is become, going to become an economic development uh, piece because folks aren't able to go back to work without having adequate child care. In our county, we're down to two child care centers in our county. The college just closed theirs for lack of funding. Um, you know, it seems to me like this would be a valid COVID uh, expense. Your thoughts, anybody's thoughts on that? Director Harrison Lee, we are still looking at how some of the other states are expending uh, their funds as it relates to child care. So we, we don't have a definitive on that issue just yet. Okay, and then I have just one more question. Um, and I'm not sure who can answer this, but in regards to the $50 million and um, when can we expect the governor to do a, start doing allotments? Uh, that would, well, in regards to the $50 million that we had placed in the budget, we're gonna start looking at some of the applications that you've been receiving from about the end of April uh, tomorrow. Um, and, and from what the question that I asked before, there hasn't been much of an overlap. Um, so obviously if there has been, if that's been approved by the executive committee with Spark and then is approved tomorrow by the State Finance Council, there obviously would be no reason for us to address that application if it happens to be uh, duplicative uh, with the $50 million that we had in Senate Bill 66. Um, and then we'll go through those applications uh, tomorrow, or not tomorrow, Wednesday, uh, after the State Finance Council meeting, and then make a recommendation to the Legislative Coordinating Council, which was stipulated in the budget bill that we passed in, in March. As far as uh, the time frame of the governor making allotments, 
Um, I would probably have to defer that to Will. I don't know what the discussion has been in the governor's office in regards to that particular um, issue uh, or concern. Um, so I'd have to turn it over to the governor's office. I, I'm not privy to any information in regards to allotments being made uh, for the 21 budget. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Will Lawrence, Governor Chief of Staff. Um, this is something the governor is reviewing. Uh, there will be a finance council meeting towards the end of the month, uh, which is your, your traditional meeting to review uh, finance and the certificate of indebtedness. Um, and uh, there will be a discussion at that point in time um, regarding uh, allotments and, and cash flow um, for the city of Kansas going into uh, FY21. So um, those conversations will be coming um, here in the next, over the next couple of weeks. That answer your question, Representative Carpenter? Yes, yes, and thank you very much for that. Thank you. Uh, Senator Billinger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Billinger from the 40th District. Uh, a couple of my questions were answered. One that was on the backfill for the 50 million that we had put in our original budget. But uh, Harrison Lee uh, mentioned on the second round that we're gonna be doing public and private funding. Can you give me some examples of on the, uh, on the private side? Uh, are, are, are we, how are we gonna, figure that out? How, how are you going to choose? I mean, are these folks that haven't been able to open till recently or are these folks that were, were just closed maybe initially? Or are we talking small mom and pops? Are we talking Boeing? What, what are we talking? Director Harrison Lee, that is a conversation with the steering committee and the executive committee of how we might look at bringing together public-private partnerships to be able to utilize some of the funds that we have remaining. So we have not determined that yet. We need to have those discussions with the committees. Okay, so it could include small, like beauty shops that have been closed for two months, don't qualify for unemployment in the state of Kansas, haven't received their, their uh, uh, funds from the federal side of it. And, you know, folks like that, would, would, would we be considering these kind of people, you think? Uh, Director Harrison Lee, uh, Office of Recovery. Yes, the, the committees have the ability to look at how they might help small businesses be able to recover. So that is an option. Okay. Well, I, I'm glad to hear we're going to look at not just larger and, not and just Senator, ones. Senator Bellinger, if I could um, chime in and um, because I know Director Harrison Lee was going around to all the different breakout sessions when we were having our individual groups um, discussing the four different areas, uh, which she had mentioned earlier, as far as education, infrastructure, healthcare, and economic development. And actually, Senator McGinn and I were in the same breakout session, and we had um, a, a pretty lengthy conversation in regards to economic development. Uh, right now, it's kind of I would say at its infancy, we're still having those discussions going on on how we want to have that, what that would look like. Um, you know, there were some members in our group that were saying we would have grants that would go out to small business owners. Uh, there were some who would say we'd rather have that be in the form of a either a low or zero percent interest loan um, that would be administered most likely through the Department of Commerce from the CARES Act money. Um, so those were some of the discussions that we were having in our particular breakout session in regards to how we can have funds from the CARES Act through the SPARC committee be funneled into our economy and to the small businesses across the state of Kansas. Thank you. So am I understanding this correctly that these funds can be used for the, the economic uh, uh, displacement for the businesses, even though it isn't direct covid expense? I mean, it is because they have closed, but does that work for that? I mean, that's, I guess, part of my question is how we determine in which ones work and which ones don't, you know, without uh, proper direction. Well, I, I, Director Harrison Lee, I don't know if you have an, an answer to that. I would probably say there has to be some type of a direct correlation that it was uh, COVID-19, the pandemic, that caused the business to close um, and to receive whether that be a loan or a grant or whatever the case may be, um, they have to. There would have to be some type of COVID-19 
relationship as as to why that business was closed. I mean, you mentioned a beauty shop. Well, I mean, they definitely were closed because of COVID-19 pandemic. Um, they were deemed non-essential. And so they weren't able to uh, perform their business. Um, so I, I would think that that would be a, a direct relationship as to uh, a reason why those dollars that are uh, going to be uh, administered through the CARES Act were COVID-19 related. Um, Director Harrison Lee? Uh, yes, Director Harrison Lee, they would need to demonstrate a COVID-19 relationship in order to be able to expend these funds. Thank you, I appreciate your uh, attending today. Welcome. Senator Hawk. Thank you. Uh, uh, my question is either for Senator Harrison, uh, Senator, this is Senator Hawk, for Cheryl Harrison Lee or JG. Uh, and it follows up on Senator Bellinger's question on the businesses. Uh, do, do we know how many businesses applied for but didn't get some of those early CARES Act monies that were administered as either SBA or Commerce Department? Then I have a couple other questions after that. And, and I guess my question is, might, might some of those uh, be eligible for consideration by the, the uh, SPARC committee? So Director Harrison Lee, I do not know how many businesses did not receive funds that applied. Uh, is, is that something we could get from uh, Secretary Tolan and sort of find out what the magnitude and dollar amount was? I think that would be helpful for the next steering committee meeting, just to kind of have that as a data point. As a Actually, I will reach out. Thank you. Um, the other question I have, and this may be JG, um, uh, do we need to, are, are we to the point where we need to replenish unemployment at KDOL funds? And if so, can uh, this CARES money be used for that? Uh, JG Scott, Legislative Research. Um, right now, we still have a, a healthy balance in the unemployment uh, trust fund. So uh, it's my understanding that it can be used for it, though. Uh, Director Harrison Lee would be a better person to answer that. But um, as of right now, we still have a, a good balance. Um, luckily, when we when this whole thing started, we did have a, a, a very large balance in that that trust fund. So uh, um, we had a, a good starting point, much in the same way as we did with the state general fund as well. But uh, I believe you can use that for for the unemployment trust fund. But uh, like I said. Director Harrison Lee would probably know better than I. Well, uh, a follow-up to that. We talked about phase three uh, and expecting we might get another spike. And if we did, I'm just wondering if, if this uh, uh, CARES funding might be wisely spent at least uh, replenishing some of that because uh, I don't know what our balance is now and I don't know what we, I think it was close to, $900 million plus when we started. And I don't know, and I know we got in trouble, I think in 2008 with that recession after that in terms of having a balance. So uh, I just raised that as a question of uh, how, do we, how do we figure that? And maybe that's something this LBC group needs to be on top of also. Thank you. Director Harrison Lee, did you have any follow up on those questions or? Director Harrison Lee, I do not. I'll have to take a look and see how we might be able to, you know, evaluate that option. All right. Um, I haven't seen anybody else's, else's hands being raised. Uh, Stephen, are there anybody uh, that you have that uh, would like to ask any follow up questions? Uh, nope, that's it. Okay. Are there any other questions uh, for Director Harrison Lee uh, in regards to the, the SPARC money? That'll be the topic of discussion tomorrow at the State Finance Council. I'm not seeing anybody's hands. So uh, once again, 
Yes, Representative Carpenter. Carpenter. Representative from the 75th District. Just, um, I wasn't sure if uh, they had heard the, what I'd asked for about the, uh, the allowances for COVID. The descriptions and, and all that of what we could use it for. Is that a huge document? Director Harrison Lee. So Director Harrison Lee, no, I can make that available to you. The guidance? Yes, I can. Thank you. Not a huge document. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Senator Hawk. A uh, question on that. Is that that nine plus uh, 10 page document that we got last week? Is that the guidance, the latest guidance document? The the yes, you guys received a copy of the guidance last week. Any other further questions? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Uh, thank you, Director Harrison Lee, for being here today and answering our questions. Uh, we had actually planned on adjourning at two and we went on a little over, but um, I think this is a, a, a prevalent reason why we wanted to have the discussion. Um, and, and discuss some of the, uh, the different nuances on how the SPARC committee is going to be working and exactly um, uh, what the aspects are of that in respect to the COVID-19 legislation uh, that was passed during the special session. Um, but with that, thank you, uh, Director Harrison Lee, for being here. Uh, again, thank you again for the, you know, being here on short notice. Um, sure. But I will see you tomorrow at the State Finance Council meeting. Okay, uh, thank you. Senator McGinn, did you have any other comments? There we go. Sorry there. about that. Oh, I did not. Sorry. I couldn't get back to my screen. So I guess we'll see most, many of you tomorrow and the rest of you on Wednesday. Yes. So right. uh, since there are no more other questions, uh, we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting. And then uh, we are meeting at 9 a.m. on Wednesday morning. I think it's 9.30. 9.30, okay. Yep. So I will see everybody at 9.30 on Wednesday morning. All right, bye.